So despite the uh, little overcast weather, uh, it is uh, Labor Day weekend. And uh, of course, we all know that what that means. It's uh, coming towards the end of summer. We pray for another six weeks of uh, decent warmish weather, at least for the farmers and for our attitude, our disposition. Uh, we have what's called uh, Indian summer to look forward to, I hope, or more politically correct, First Nations summer. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we uh, hope that there's some decent weather, get the crops off, things like that. But uh, we all know that if this is Labor Day weekend, going forward, you don't wear white after Labor Day weekend. I think that's the, uh, the legend. It is painful that it's uh, rainy this weekend, and uh, so if you're planning to barbecue, get together with family, uh, you've got to be under the uh, tent or under the porch or whatever it is. Um, the tradition of Labor Day dates, dates back to uh, the 1870s in Canada, back in the East in Hamilton, I think. Uh, there was a bit of a movement among printers and uh, others, and they were agitating for a reduction in hours worked. They wanted a reduction down to a 58-hour work week. Huh? 58 hours. We, we don't want to work more than 58 hours in a week. And uh, back then, I think typically it was uh, 10 hours a day, six days a week, and even uh, perhaps more. And perhaps the attitude was, well, even the Lord labored for six days in creation. Man should labor for six days of the week, and on the seventh he should rest. And uh, as we all know, uh, in some way or another, Father works from sun to sun, but Mother's work is never done. So, you know, the idea was, and so that movement that began, uh, I think spilled over into Toronto. And uh, in fact, back then, uh, unionizing and organizing was frowned upon and quite a few leaders were arrested. And I think uh, John A. MacDonald got into a struggle with somebody who had uh, owned uh, the papers and the presses. And after it was all sort of settled down, it was because there were laws passed that said, yeah, you can organize your labor force. Uh, you can go ahead, and of course all of this goes back to Ontario, we all know where that, that comes from. As Albertans we can blame them for all sorts of uh, things that went wrong. But anyway, as a result of that, uh, there was a celebration and we still have it to this day. It uh, trickled on down to New York and was picked up as well. And uh, we have a day in which we uh, respect the trades, the laborers. Uh, we say, yeah, labor is a dignified pursuit. Uh, we should respect labor. And uh, this, of course, grew out of the idea that uh, as laborers and as tradesmen, as people who sweat for a living, well, we, to quote Rodney Dangerfield, we get no respect. And so Labor Day uh, gives us a little bit of a sense of, yeah, uh, in all labor there is profit. In all labor, there is that which should be respected. And of course, today, if you work more than about 44 hours in a week, uh, you expect to uh, be paid, what, time and a half. Uh, if, certainly, if you worked on a stat holiday, you don't want double time, or if you're lucky in uh, certain areas, triple time. Uh, but back then, the idea of working 65, 70 hours a week was normal. And, well, you know, Today, what would we say to each other if, uh, if uh, we're parting? Uh, one of the many things that we might say to each other is, uh, see you later, don't work too hard. Don't work too hard. Uh, and of course, we have a certain amount of uh, tension uh, between what has been called the Protestant work ethic and uh, the idea that, well, you know, work can be pretty, uh, pretty irksome sometimes. Uh, we certainly see that with uh, millionaires arguing with billionaires as to who, how much they're worth. Uh, to play a sport or to perform certain uh, activities. Uh, but uh, for certain uh, times, we, we, we might even think of work as a curse. And we'd go back all the way to Genesis, wouldn't we? And we'd look back at the fall and we'd ask the question, well, what exactly is going on here when God says to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you? Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the dust. Oh, man. Life's hard, then you die. You know, this sort of uh, feeling. And so we have that idea. And I know that uh, flogging through weeds 
uh, can be irksome and tiresome because they come back again, which is why I choose not to tackle them and I leave it to someone else. But anyway, no, I, I own a weed whipper and occasionally I've been known to whip weeds. Uh, but maintenance is an irksome thing. You think, I've done this once before. Surely I did it, I did it once, I did it right. But things wear down, don't they? And things decay. I had the irksome task uh, just recently of having to go to a rental unit that uh, for my sins I own and uh, the folks who moved out, uh, I mean absolutely everything had to be revived. The ceilings had to be painted, the walls had to be painted, the floors had to be revived in some way and uh, me and a couple other buddies, uh, you know, we had to just make sure that was done before anybody else would consider it worth living in. And uh, things like that are just, well, frustrating. Why do you have to put that work in? Why do you have to do that? Why do these people not respect and at least try to maintain it for themselves? But that's one of the things of life, even your own house, even my house, which I have uh, sort of been reasonably kind to. I know it's time to do a lot of stuff. That's why my basement is empty. And uh, I've got to try to uh, see to it that it gets painted and renovated and revived because uh, it's just one of those things. Maybe not thistles and thorns, but it's still a pain. On the other hand, uh, we do read in the scriptures, and I took the uh, title of the sermon from this, Proverbs 14, 23, in all labor there is profit. And uh, that was uh, one of the many Proverbs that were drummed into my head as a youngster. In all labor there is profit. So do not object to being asked to work, Bob. Uh, in fact, the talk of the lips tends only to penury. Or if you want a little bit uh, a better translation of that, all hard work brings a profit, brings some benefit, it says. But mere talk leads only to poverty. And uh, we kind of intrinsically understand, don't we, that if you want a job done, you kind of give it to a busy man. Chances are, if he knows how to move and accomplish, he might move and accomplish on your behalf. But there are those who will, I would respectfully say, uh, talk a job to death, uh, talk a good uh, a game, but don't understand that essentially the truth of this is we do in life reap uh, what we sow. Now, I know there are a lot of variables. I know a lot of unfairness in life, but uh, there is kind of a rough justice in the world. And we do tend to reap what we sow. And God, who has given us talents and has given us time and has given us opportunity, well, when it comes to work, he says, you know, you're the one who has to maybe develop the skills. Maybe you have to uh, use the resources you have to participate in this. And at a physical level, we learn that as young people. Uh, it's, you know, you're gonna get out of life kind of to some extent what you put into it. And so you need to put into life. And you think of Jesus, and we always think of him as the great orator, the great teacher. His words live all the way down to this day. His illustrations, his parables, his stories. But you know, even though he came to earth to minister to mankind, um, well, he had to grow up, and uh, he was born under the law, and he did obey his parents, and he reached the age of about 13, and he was bar mitzvah, you know, that age, about 12 or so, 13, and you find him in the temple discussing with the high foreheads the meaning of the law, but then it says he went back home, and what did he do? He was sub subject to his parents, and he grew in reputation because he was a good kid. And as a good kid, what did he do? He learned his father's trade, as Jewish kids tended to do, or an uncle's trade, something like that. And he was known not as the, uh, the scribe or the Pharisee or the rabbi from Nazareth. He was known as the carpenter from Nazareth. And that was a pretty tough trade back then. And it wasn't just a case of getting a power nailer and framing up something and putting it up and saying, well, that's good. It was a case of humping stones and putting them together and building dwellings for people to live in. And so Jesus spent about 17 years of his life, maybe 18 years of his life, physically working. And apparently nobody complained. Uh, they ridiculed the fact that he may have been born of fornication, they said, and they brought that up. 
they ridiculed the fact that he was from Nazareth, but nobody ever said, and by the way, he's a lousy worker. And by the way, have you ever seen what he built? Nobody ever brought that up. Nobody ever criticized his work ethic because apparently uh, he was a competent and capable human being. And he spent more hours on this earth uh, humping rocks, dragging timbers, and doing physical labor than anything else. And his ministry, uh, if you look at it, uh, we talk about three and a half years, but actually publicly he probably only spoke about three or two and a half years. And uh, that was it. And so, as a human being, he reflected the nature of God. God, uh, and you can say this is a bit of a condescension as you try to understand the nature of creation and so forth. But uh, the, the parable, the story, uh, the way it's told to us is God labored when he created. And we, as the reflection of our Father, uh, as those made in the image and likeness of God, are told that we find satisfaction in labor. We find a certain reward in doing things, just as the implication is you're a reflection of God and God takes pleasure in his work. And so on this Labor Day weekend, I sort of uh, think about that. Even you come to the New Testament and Paul will tell those who are slaves of all things, and you can apply this to a the sort of a, a, an employer-employee situation, but slaves. He even says you ought to work hard. You ought to work with a disciplined attitude. You ought to work with the idea that you're working for your master in heaven, which is kind of a weird thing to say if you think about it uh, when you're talking about slaves. In Ephesians, he says this, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. Now, they had to obey their earthly masters because they had power of life and death over them. But Paul adds this. He said, your respect and some admiration and some restraint and with sincerity of heart. Oh, now you've gone too far. No, he says this, just as you would obey Christ. And this brings us to sort of an attitude which, again, may be called the uh, Protestant work ethic. But what is the healthy thing for a human being uh, in all their endeavors, uh, consider themselves as in the employment of Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor, but when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ. Ooh, you're really digging deep here now, Paul, trying to comfort people and tell them, you know, I realize that you're working for a taskmaster, but think of it as working for your Father in heaven. Think of it as being in harness with Christ himself, doing the will of God from your heart. So who do you work for? Who do you answer to? You know, I think of one man when I was involved in building something quite a while ago, and it was a duplex. And in one side, uh, we were working away, and in theory, this was going to be sold, and eventually it was sold to somebody who wanted to live in it. And he was going to buy the other side as well. The stinker, he never did come through with that. But anyway, that's why I still own it, to my embarrassment. But thank God it's got a dependable renter in there, so they help pay all the expenses. In fact, they pay all the expenses. Thank you. But when it was under construction, i never forget the attitude of uh, one individual that I hired as the, quote, project manager, the foreman. And uh, the one side he was building when he knew the owner was going to live in that. But the other side, there were a number of things where the shortcuts were taken. And uh, the response was always, hey, we, we, shouldn't we do this differently, Simon? No, 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 it's only a rental. It's only a rental. And so several times I heard that response. I said, well, look, look, somebody's going to own this. Yeah, yeah, but it's only a rental. And of course, today, guess who owns that rental? Loser, you know. But that was the attitude. And I heard that on a regular basis. Nay, this is normal. Actually, he was the son of a Lutheran pastor. And um, I, you know, assumed that there were certain Christian values that would have sort of knocked on. Um, because, uh, but they didn't. And uh, he didn't consider this a job that should be done and done well. Um, if there was a corner to be cut, let's cut it. Uh, if there's a mistake that's made, let's just slough past it. 
And of course, it's only a rental. Well, who are we working for here? Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Wow, that's a heavy responsibility, isn't it? To consider the work of my hand as serving the Lord. And of course, Jesus set that example himself. He was the son of a carpenter and he was himself a carpenter and he worked for the Lord and he was the Lord. Okay, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they're slave or free. So there is some sort of intrinsic reward. And again, I think that is reflected all the way back in the Proverbs that, uh, you know, the sleep of the laboring man, it says, is sweet, uh, whether he eats much or little. Uh, that to do a job and to do it well and to reflect the very nature of God in our work is, is rewarding. Uh, I know, uh, of course, many of us are retired and uh, so uh, perhaps it's not immediately you know, something that you think about right now, but I'll bet you dollars to donuts that you used to think this way as Christians in times past. And I think you'd like to pass that along to your kids and your grandkids. And in fact, I know some of you uh, have uh, kids who followed your trade. I know some of you, and I, I know perhaps your parents. Uh, I, I think of one person whose uh, dad uh, uh, was simply asked once, uh, and he had a reputation for being an excellent craftsman and a worker, and he was simply asked, you know, so what do you do for relaxation? And he answered with a straight face, we work. And, uh, you know, you may say, well, that's a very, very German approach. But uh, uh, apparently the, uh, that was reflected in the quality of his work and the fact that everybody wanted to contract him when they had certain things to be done. And so uh, perhaps I could digress for a few moments and just ask, well, what is a work ethic? You know, what does it look like? Um, I think uh, there are a few things that, you know, I personally would think uh, might be relevant, uh, some consciousness of time, you know, showing up on time, uh, putting in the time, expressions like that. I think of one man, and uh, he would uh, uh, usually show up on time, uh, but uh, he would begin to think about 2.30, quarter to three, he'd pull out his watch, and he would think about quitting time, which was five o'clock. And uh, I, he, he once, as he was working on this particular project many years ago, um, I, uh, he, he, he brought along his nephew and uh, he sort of worked with him for a little while. And at uh, one particular point in some frustration, he said to his nephew in front of me, he said, you know, Bob is a wonderful guy. Thank you, you know, but he has one great weakness. You know, he'll start a project, he'll start a piece of work uh, uh, when it's close to quitting time. And for him, close to quitting time was like 2.30, 3 o'clock. And so if you asked him, well, you know, do you think we could get this done before the end of the day? Oh, no, 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 we'd have to do that tomorrow. So I had like two, two and a half hours to go. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, it felt like too much, uh, like I'd have to put it. And I, so I, he worked for somebody else uh, a little bit later. And I asked that individual, I said, uh, uh, how's it going? He said, oh, it's, it's, uh, it's okay. He said, uh, but he, he certainly is a clock watcher. I said, well, how do you cope with that? He said, well, he said around uh, 430, 435, 440, when he starts to sort of mentally pack up and physically pack up his tools, he said, I go over and I start to work alongside him. And uh, it became a little bit of a game. And uh, he'd go over and work alongside him and he'd just keep going. It's quarter, 10, five to five. I mean, I guess the tension became palpable. Well, are we gonna quit? Are we gonna quit? Are we gonna quit? And he'd just keep going and he worked till five and then he worked till two, three, four minutes after. So, oh, look, it's, it's quitting time. I guess it's time we start to pack up our tools, you know, and he would do that. But uh, for this individual, he'd start to pack up mentally at about three o'clock and by 4.30 he was packing up and uh, quitting time at five meant 10 to five, this sort of thing. And so to giving full measure, is certainly uh, something like uh, commitment um, to whatever you, you, you agree to do. Um, I 
was uh, talking just recently to an individual who is uh, a well-placed executive in a uh, multinational corporation. And he decided uh, he's uh, going to retire sometime soon. He decided he wanted to convert the basement, his rather lovely home, uh, into a little more dwelling area. So he contracted somebody to cut a hole in the basement wall and put a door in. But being uh, perhaps culturally uh, a little different uh, than uh, maybe you or I might be, uh, he contracted somebody who obviously was of the same culture and uh, sort of was, well, we do it on the cheap here. And uh, so uh, I happened to go by his house one day and say, hey, how you doing, Raj? And uh, he had uh, a big hole by the side of his house. And he said, well, it's been a couple of months. And this just guy you know, says he'll show up, but then he doesn't show up. Or then he shows up for a day, and then he doesn't show up some more. Because of course, this is a side job he's doing. And sure, you cut corners, and you can do things. But now he's getting really frustrated. Because at work, he, as he once said to, in my hearing, he said, you know, at work, my no means no. Then I come home, and I, you know, I don't hardly have a say. Because you know, for my wife, not so much. And uh, well, that's just life, Raj. That's just life. But uh, here it is, uh, he expects somebody to show up just as they would in his corporation. And this guy just is either not gonna show up or uh, his commitment is, well, we're halfway through, you can't back out now, and so you're just gonna have to live with me. And so showing up and actually doing a job. Uh, I think of uh, something like just considering other people. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I think of one individual, uh, uh, he's a lovely guy, but uh, he, uh, uh, he'll do his job. And of course, anytime you work, you sort of leave junk behind. And so if he does his job, he's a guy who does drywall and T-bar ceilings, you know, drop ceilings. And after he finishes, uh, it looks good. And then you try to pick your f way through all the junk that's on the floor. But he likes to come in, do his job. As he said uh, once in my hearing, you know, uh, I do this stuff for a dollar a square foot. So if I come in and an hour later I've done 200 square feet, I've made $200. Oh, that's very impressive. Uh, and then I leave and there's a junk all over the place. And uh, that's not very considerate of others, but well, you know, I got mine, I got mine. I think of uh, factors like pride of accomplishment, the satisfaction that the Proverbs say you can take from work. And, uh, you know, sometimes you observe, I remember observing one fellow and he was uh, uh, putting uh, just a threshold in a commercial door space. And there's aluminum and he had to cut around certain things and do certain things. And so he fiddled with it and I walk by and I come back and see him about an hour later, he'd finished. And he stepped back and he saw me, he said, hi. He said, hey, Trevor's just done a perfect job, meaning himself. And he looked at this, and of course it was a fiddly thing, and it just looked really nice. If you walked into a commercial building or any other place like that, and you saw that, you say, hey, somebody took pride in their work. And he said, uh, Trevor's just done a perfect job. And he paused, and he looked at me, and he said, it's pity girls aren't impressed with this. <laughs> you know, and no, nobody takes the satisfaction out of looking at this that I do. And I'm, hey, good for you, buddy. You know, you, you, you felt a certain pride of accomplishment. And God has built us that way. Any, anybody remember the old movie Chariots of Fire? You know, okay. You know, it's an award-winning movie. British. Just thought I'd throw that in. But you remember when uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the two, uh, Harold Abrahams and uh, the uh, Scottish missionary, you know, they're battling forth to see who is the greater... Uh, athlete, and the Scotsman uh, is being told by his uh, relatives after church that they need a muscular Christian. And so if you go to the Olympics and you win something, then we can point to that and say, hey, you know, God, uh, God is with us, and uh, this is somebody you should listen to. And he said, oh, he said, this is so, uh, so frivolous. He said, I want to go back to the mission field in China. I want to do these things. And he said, no, no, you've got to go to the Olympics. He said, look, he said, uh, in his Scottish accent, he said, you can glorify God by peeling a spud, you know, by peeling a potato correctly and doing it to the glory of God. 
A little bit later, uh, he actually is uh, preaching a sermon on a Sunday morning in Paris. Uh, and uh, he has refused to run on as he feels the Sabbath, which is Sunday. And he, uh, he talks about uh, the uh, winning the race. And uh, there's this uh, quotation that he has. And I think he gives it actually to his sister when she's arguing with it one time. He said, he said I, I know God made me, and God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. I think Trevor felt God's pleasure when he stepped back from a piece of aluminum that he worked with. And he said, man, he said, I've done a good job. I listened to somebody here a while ago uh, who'd laid down a floor. And he said, I'm really, really happy with this. Now, when you do a good job, when you finish something, uh, then you feel a certain pride of accomplishment. I know I, I got to know actually Shelley uh, uh, in uh, romantic circumstances. We were putting down a hardwood floor together. You know, and I'd say to any single person, if you want to get to know someone, just put down a hardwood floor. And after a day of hanging away at these things, you know, you feel, you know, and uh, you step back from it. And this is something we did together. And it was really rewarding. Uh, it was in her house in Calgary. I don't know how I quite got conned into it. Uh, but anyway, I, I was. And it was a certain pride of accomplishment. And uh, it was uh, something that uh, helped us uh, bond over something. And so there is a, a satisfaction and a, quote, pride of accomplishment that God wants us to have in our work. And there's also, I think, reputation, the, uh, just the feeling we leave behind us, uh, the work that we've done. I know uh, my uh, son, who sadly has gone through a number of uh, uh, setbacks uh, because of injuries and other disabilities that have entered in now. But uh, for some years, he was a laborer for a, uh, a, uh, an engineering company called Focus. And he, uh, he, he eventually, after a number of years, he bounced back and forth working with uh, um, surveyors. But he uh, um, worked very well with a fellow by the name of Darren, who was the senior surveyor. And uh, he simply uh, s told management, uh, I don't want to work with anybody else but this guy uh, because he is able to pay attention and work with me and work for me. And it's so good, it's almost like he reads my mind. And I thought, well, that was really, really nice uh, to hear that because that certainly was not my experience growing up you know, with the kid. Uh, he was not, I would find myself channeling my father on occasion. Uh, I don't know if your dad ever said this, but my dad would say to me when we were trying to work together, just pay attention. And if I were to wander off, don't walk off the job. Don't walk off the job. You know, don't do that. And so, um, you know, Adam was a little more, you know, whatever. And he would occasionally walk off the job. And I'd have to tell him that. And here he, he uh, worked for somebody who uh, complimented him. And I met the guy on many occasions after that. Uh, and he would say uh, the uh, satisfaction he got working with him. And uh, when he got promoted, then he, uh, he became the uh, supervisor for uh, the entire field crews, all the field crews. He went to management and said, give this person a chance to take over the job I was doing. He said, that's crazy, you can't do that. Uh, he has no uh, official qualifications, doesn't have a degree, and so forth. He said, I don't care. I'm just telling you that he can do anything I was doing. And so he was able to take that situation and did very well for quite a while at that. Uh, sadly, uh, uh, when uh, there were takeovers and, and uh, things got rolled back in uh, about 2014, uh, all the laborers were laid off, and they had to sort of double up. And uh, there was, there's not an issue. Uh, you can keep the job, but uh, uh, when everybody had to take it in turn swinging a hammer and doing other things, uh, and you don't have, uh, you know, you have numerous injuries that you can't do that, then you have to take, uh, make, uh, make a hard choice, make a hard decision. I know that the uh, satisfaction that came the from having a good rep uh, being name requested on numerous opportunities was really rewarding and fulfilling. And to lose that, 
was, uh, you know, has been really devastating. Why? Uh, just because when you take pride in your accomplishment, you put your heart into something, you leave a reputation behind, hence the old expression, if you want a job done, give it to this guy over here who's a busy man. Had a very satisfying experience just uh, for uh, uh, the guys that were um, working here uh, just recently uh, for Ezra and Mike, uh, uh, you know, finding their way in Canada. They actually offer, uh, uh, and they're going to have to enter into uh, English language classes. They've accomplished certain things, uh, but also uh, just coming as new immigrants to Canada, uh, they uh, go through certain training and orientation because it's a very different culture. But uh, uh, I had uh, one of our members uh, actually got their fence done a few years ago. And uh, the people who did it as a result of doing a good job, the, the next four or five uh, neighbors requested the same thing. It turned into like a, a neighborhood type thing. And uh, that neighborhood uh, came back and asked me, do you know anybody who can paint our fences? And I happened to know a couple of real handsome guys who had just arrived and kind of wanted to do something. So uh, even before they got orientated to uh, Canada, uh, they were able to and are in the middle of doing that. And uh, every uh, time I help them uh, sort of uh, get there and get going, and I talk to the people they've worked for, they all say what a wonderful pleasure it is to have them working and uh, how diligent they are. And we, we talked a little bit about how things are different between Africa and Canada. Uh, in uh, Africa, for example, there's a different culture. Uh, the women work and the men supervise. I said, in Canada, any that way. <laughs> in Canada, uh, uh, man proposes, but woman disposes. Simple as that. Uh, you know, we, we had a little humor about that. This is the way it is. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we talked about was if you paint a fence, you can't drip things on the, uh, uh, the concrete or you can't drip it on the, uh, the plants. And uh, Ezra very accurately observed, he said, oh, back in Malawi, you just slop everything over. You know, that's the way it is. And uh, he instinctively understood that he was looking at something that, yeah, you've got to do this differently than perhaps people might do in that particular culture. And uh, he was thinking it through and, and finding his way through. And I thought it was really rewarding, and especially rewarding knowing that they were already uh, respected and there was some affection. Affection is expressed in numerous ways. Uh, but I think of one lady who wanted her yard, uh, you know, her, her fence painted, and she's an immigrant herself from Poland, she and her husband. And uh, she said, how, what a great pleasure it was to work with them. And uh, how do you express pleasure? Uh, you go to Tim Hortons and bring Timbits. You know, uh, you, know you, you, you find a way to, uh, uh, to uh, feed or nourish the workers because you respect them. Now, as we talk about simple things like that, which we all relate to when it comes to the concept of simply working, Again, why are we this way? We are a reflection of the one who created us. And again, talking about Jesus uh, and his personal example, uh, you look at uh, John chapter 5, and it would just cut into uh, a discussion here uh, where Jesus does something on the Sabbath that really ticks them off. We talked a little bit about that last week. And it tells us, therefore, did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him? because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. And Jesus makes the interesting comment. He says, you know, my father works hitherto and I work. And he was sort of hinting here that God who dwells beyond time, beyond space, God who is not bound to a holy place or confined to holy time, but is now vested in holy people, uh, is still always dynamic and productive and at work with us and for us and through us. And of course, the Jews sought to kill him uh, because he'd not only broken the Sabbath, but said that God was his father, making himself equal to God. But as I said, Jesus in his physical life, uh, even though he kept the law according to uh, the spirit and the letter of the law and understood the law better than these 
yahoos who thought that, you know, healing on the Sabbath was uh, just uh, a horrible thing to do, uh, nonetheless proposes to them, you know, in the real spiritual world, my father is constantly at work. And of course, he reflects our reality as Christians in the New Covenant. Uh, work is an ongoing thing. And it is the, by the, God's nature, and it is also something he gives to share with us and which we participate in. And here you come to the real sort of crux of the matter. Paul expresses it uh, beautifully. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. You know, what is the work of the Lord? Well, everything your hand finds to do. Everything that you tackle in a, a, a uh, quality, systematic, uh, sincere way versus a, hey, it's just a rental. Uh, there are no eternal consequences to this. We'll be through, we'll be gone. Nobody have to worry about whether the pipes leak or something collapses. We don't have to worry about that. No, we are investing in eternity. And even though we uh, think, well, we sometimes put it this way, we are the light of the world. Light doesn't say anything. We're the city on the hill that cannot be hidden, doesn't move, you know, things like that. But in reality, everything that we do is the work of the Lord. And your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so we are constantly finding ourselves a reflection of God's character, his will, his force, his energy in our lives. And this is sometimes, you know, it, it is in fact quite a bit of work to be the light of the world, isn't it? It's not a particularly passive thing sometimes. I think of times when, uh, as I said, you know, Mike, Ezra, thanks. Noah sometimes. People are just happy to see people who are humble and working and productive and not sitting around talking things to death and not sloppy and careless, but actually reflect uh, certain character traits that are the character traits of God himself. And that's something that we tend to recognize. I, I sort of am constantly aware, especially as I get older, that, yeah, everything I'm doing is going to be remembered by the kids, the grandkids, people around me, the neighbors. How am I doing as the light of the world? I had the experience uh, just uh, the other day. This is a bad example. Uh, I'd gone to U-Haul and rented a trailer. And, uh, you know, typically you, you're in a trailer. It's a 24-hour rental. You pay your 25 bucks, your 35 bucks, and you got it for a day. And in this particular case, uh, the lady, uh, for some bizarre reason, I uh, picked it up at 7 in the morning. She said, uh, 1.45 p.m. return. Said, Who brings something back at 1.45? And so I said, well, no, I can't really do that. She said, oh, well, she said it's on the contract. And she physically changed it to 7 p.m. I said, well, you close at 7 p.m. If I don't make it by 7 p.m. and it's 7 a.m., right? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, that's right. Don't worry, I'll change it on the system. Well, I tootled back. In fact, I, she said, I'll, I'll change it because you'll probably get a phone call if we don't. I'm not particularly used to that either, but this is a new location that's more convenient. So um, actually, the next morning, I got a phone call, uh, which coincided. It was about 6 o'clock. It was going to get up anyway. Are you going to come back with this trailer today? Yeah, I will. So I got back, pulled in, you know, five minutes to 7. They were already cooking there. Oh, that's fine. And the fellow came over to me, and he said, uh, that'll be two days rental. What? I brought it back in under 24 hours. No, nope, it should have been back by 1.45 yesterday, and we missed out on a rental to somebody else, so you're paying for two days. At which point I expressed myself, not using Anglo-Saxon words, but I expressed myself perhaps in a little heated turn. The hell you're not. The hell I am, you know. At which particular point I thought, the, I'm not channeling the Lord here. And he said, I don't want to deal with you. I said, well, I don't want to deal with you. And uh, so I pulled out the contract where it said 7 p.m., uh, where the lady had written it. 
And of course, I pulled out the wrong contract for my center console, and I gave it to him, and it was one from about two weeks ago. And he didn't even read it. He just said, there it is. It says it right there. Well, actually, it doesn't say it right there, and it's a totally different trailer, but it didn't matter. It's 7 in the morning. I hadn't had any coffee, and I was in the mood to act like an idiot. And if I could have gotten out of the truck, I'd have just, you know, but I didn't. And uh, so we parted with those ringing words, I don't want to deal with you. Well, I don't want to deal with you. I want to go home and get some coffee. But I went home, pulled out the right contract, and there's the lady's name, and there she put. But of course, she put it in pen. So how do you go back and say, you know, because you know, the argument would be, I changed it. So I thought, you know, fool me once, shame on you. But don't be an idiot next time. Make sure you're very specific and you don't get conned on something like that. Make sure you don't do that. I mean, how embarrassing it is. You know, what sort of an idiot are you? Can't you read a contract? Yes, I can read a contract. What do you do for a living? I preach to people how to act godly. Uh, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Well, apparently... It wasn't much labor, and whatever I did was totally in vain because the city on the hill that fortunately was obscured <laughs> by the early morning uh, and the fact that he wasn't interested in seeing a Christian example, all he wanted to do was stiff me for two days rental. So he got what he wanted, and uh, the Lord did not get from me what he wanted. But our lives are a continual unfolding of a certain labor that God has invited us to participate in. Can you carry a message of grace, of um, joy, of peace, of long-suffering, of goodness, of gentleness to this world? Apparently not without coffee, first thing in the morning. Apparently not without some effort, Lord. Well, okay, next time. And, you know, actually, in my own defense, uh, Shelley had all already gone off to work. And quite often we'll pray together in the morning and, you know, talk about the challenges of life. And uh, especially as the twins uh, were in, in great distress and danger, we started that particular routine. And uh, she'd already left, so maybe I could blame part of it on her. There was no spiritual support because I hadn't had any coffee and um, all sorts of other things. But here the exhortation is, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And that is the ultimate passion that we are called to have. And so here, as we reflect upon this uh, Labor Day weekend, I wish for Labor Day whatever it is that you're going to do with family, with friends. I hope there's not too much rain and that you get to barbecue and enjoy. I wish for this Labor Day that, uh, well, summer revives and you get to wear white for a few more weeks. If you don't, well, it's not a big loss. But I do wish uh, in whatever your efforts that you have and experience God's strength and his pleasure, the satisfaction of knowing that you do labor for the Lord in whatever it is you are doing. And I think that as you tackle those things and you accomplish those things, that is going to uh, be a great reward in this life and in the life to come. And so continued diligence in the work of the Lord, the journey we travel together with Jesus, our guide and our example, and may we strive to do as well as he did. Uh, the carpenter from Nazareth, of whom it was never said, boy, his work sucks. You know, never, never, never said that. I would like somebody to be able to say that about me in the physical realm, but I would far rather uh, have our Father in heaven say, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, come enjoy eternity with me. Enter into the pleasure of knowing eternity with me. And thank you for joining me in the work of salvation in the here and now, in the life that we share together as we journey with Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we reflect on Labor Day and uh, a little history, a little thought, uh, we, we come from a tradition that's uh, pretty hardworking. 
We come from a tradition of diligence in this life, and uh, we have enjoyed the pleasure of your inspiration and encouragement in all of our physical labors. We ask that that uh, translate also into our spiritual endeavors, that uh, we take satisfaction and know your pleasure in sharing the gospel, sharing your grace, sharing your kindness and your compassion and mercy with others, uh, just being the light of the world as you ask of us. And we uh, yield ourselves to you, the Holy Spirit, with us, in us, and through us uh, to that end and to that glory. We ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen.